Okay, we're going to get started with uh, our final session. We want to hear from our founders. They always have great insights to share with our members, and we can ask them pretty much anything. I think that if they don't want to answer, they won't. But I think we especially want to hear a little bit from Jay because we haven't gotten to hear from you at all about entrepreneurship and your thoughts on entrepreneurship. Maybe we'll start there and, and just go from there. Thank you. You know, um, the conference so far has been, to me, has been very illustrative and, and, and provided a lot of insight into entrepreneurship and, and what it means to different people. Um, you know, more of the, like the formalized definition. But for me, it, um, I, think, I think Dr. Dale actually said that, you know, uh, entrepreneurship uh, is, is really just making the decision that you are going to go in a particular direction in a very principled manner with really no guarantee that you're going to be successful. And um, I certainly took that. I was at a point, a very low point in my career, you know, not because we weren't successful, but just kind of felt like we were part of the problem and not part of the solution. I didn't want to, I didn't want to be part of the problem anymore. And, um, so I was either going to get out of the business or I was going to go in a different direction. And, um, I didn't have, I didn't know what that other direction was until, um, Keith and I met, which was really just a pure accident really. <laughs> um, but you know, once, once we met and I, I had a, a glimmer of what healthcare could be uh, again, back to, to Dr. Dale, you know, this was, this was one medical provider out of the entire country that had chosen to be upfront, transparent and competitive with, with their pricing. And for me, um, that was enough to completely turn our organization you know, 180 degrees and we built, I mean, we went all in with just surgery center of Oklahoma. And I had no idea that there was going, that this was going to be the beginning of anything. As far as I was concerned, it was the alpha and the omega of the free market medical movement. And, and that was enough. Um, and so, I mean, I think, you know, that there was certainly uncertainty and, and not to kind of resurrect the topic from last year's conference, but but I, I think an entrepreneur has to have their own form of that burn their ships moment, where doing what they continue what they have been doing is just not an option any longer. Uh, what I do see, you know, Dr. Uh, Rickner also talked about that. Um, I see a lot of people in in our space competitors, um, sometimes folks that are kind of sitting on the sidelines that you wish they would, you know, whether they be self-funded employers or other medical providers, that they're not happy with the status quo, but they also don't have the courage um, to, to do something different. They're, they seem to be waiting for the adoption of the alternative to be really easy and with limited or zero risk of failure. And until that happens, they're not going to make a move. And that to me is the, that is, that is an example of the lack of entrepreneurship. Dr. Smith, do you have anything to, to add, just opening thoughts before we get into it a little bit more? Yeah, I, I think one thing I wanted to add to the, Okay, thank you. To the discussion yesterday, <clears throat> I thought about what I've heard people in the industry referred to as healthcare entrepreneurs who are, um, who really are not. Uh, people who, for instance, come up with an idea and then lobby uh, some legislator for its mandatory purchase. 
uh, or for or they come up with some idea and then they lobby for a subsidy that mitigates the risk. And that I think there are a lot of people in this industry that are thought of as medical entrepreneurs and they're either of that ilk or they are part of some cottage industry that takes advantage um, it takes advantage of a horrible situation. I can't tell you how many emails I get a day from people wanting to um, help me leverage my AR or maximize my revenue or um, offering all of this this coding consultation. And this it's all disgusting. I mean, it's all just downstream of a of a problem. So I. Uh, I just want us all to keep in mind there are there are entrepreneurs that are mission and principle driven, and then there are opportunists uh, and those who would exploit uh, a certain situation, whether they take risk or not, um, or whether they seek to have government or somebody else mitigate their risk. Um, I think I think a lot of people think of entrepreneurs as as exploitive or or as opportunists. And I, um, I like in particular Hunter Hastings and Dr. Dale's comments because I think that keeps that in focus. Could you guys speak a little bit about maybe the FMMA as an entrepreneurial enterprise in itself? And I mean, a lot of times you're not, to be an entrepreneur, you don't have to sell uh, a product or service it could be ideas selling ideas and be an intellectual entrepreneur and how how fmma kind of fulfills that role yeah I, I know our first year uh we rented this little tiny room at the skirvin and i don't remember what our boundaries were but we decided if no one came that it was a bad idea there was no market for this organization if 50 came we would probably both reluctantly write a check to try it again. And if 75 came, that was a total win. And the fire marshal was not happy with us because there were... the room capacity was 125 and we had people out in the hallway. Yeah, out in the hallway. So the first year, uh, we realized our our risk, I yep. think, was, was uh, justified. Yeah, you... you <laughs> Yeah, you know, um, the FMMA is very much about um, entrepreneurial I I ideas. Um, it's um, it's it's not about coming up with a product. Um, it's about um, <clears throat> it's about having that courage to do what you know is right, but you've been scared to do it. And um, you know, the FMMA is is an organization that is also is not just around you know sharing best practices and sharing mm -hmm. ideas a lot of times the the conversations and the value that come out of the fmma is is, is really just being able to validate uh amongst peers um and maybe somebody that you just met but has been thinking the same thing but had nobody else they never thought that they thought they were alone that there was nobody else that shared their views whatsoever and so yeah i mean the fmma is a is a great validation uh forum that um i mean i don't know that we really thought of it as as being that when we had the idea but it became clear that very first meeting, and it's been kind of a cultural norm of every convention um, after that, the networking is, is fierce and it's probably the most valuable component of the FMMA. And I think it, it is that, it's that validation. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's like a proxy partner uh, that, you know, that you can trust and confide in uh, there are people that attend who are alone and they don't have anybody really they feel comfortable bouncing their ideas off of and that, that may be part of the networking draw of the organization. Yeah, and I, maybe tying into what Dr. Dale talked about, trust for mutually beneficial exchange in the market, you have to have mutual trust. 
And something that Dr. McCary has often talked about is the trust in the system has been broken for so long that we can be part of that solution to help restore that trust for the consumer to be a, maybe not like a consumer protection organization. In the free market world, you don't necessarily need the government to be a consumer protector. You can have other organizations like like the FMMA to be that clearinghouse to make sure that we can identify the good guys and, and people can trust that. I was just going to say in a, in a, in a free market in, the, in the, the healthcare world that we all envision, um, and Dr. Rickner mentioned, uh, you know, all the people that used to be in the, uh, in the exam room um, when he was an employed physician, you know, now it's just <clears throat> him and his patient. And so as far as consumer protection, the best consumer protection is for the ability for the patient to, to fire you and, and make another choice. Um, and, and that's what our vision is of, of healthcare. I mean, uh, you know, Dr. Smith and I have, have operated essentially on a handshake on paper for almost 10 years now. And we know that if, if we don't mutually respect and, um, have mutual accountability to one another, we've both got options. And, you know, I, I see so much in, I mean, just this week, <clears throat> I had a couple of phone calls with some physicians in other parts of the country that were talking about a lot of these um, bundle aggregators that are uh, coming into their market where basically they're well, I mean, for lack of a better term, they're they're much more similar to a bundle, a bundle driven PPO network, which seeks to contract uh, with medical providers and then wrap them up in a some sort of an exclusive uh, pay for access uh, type of an environment. And, you know, that is um, that prevents the, the the judgment of the marketplace. Uh, to be able to occur. I mean, if if you're an employer and you want to have access to a particular facility or a particular DPC or a particular hospital and you sign up with one of these organizations and you don't like the care that's being provided, a lot of times those organizations will prohibit you from then going out and cutting a deal with somebody that you want to. And so I think we all have to be very, very vigilant that the, you know the 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 free market and the power of the market to to protect the consumer is the ability for the patient uh, or the buyer to have the freedom to buy or to not buy um, from a, a given seller and and that's the protection and the discipline that is inflicted by the market and it it does feel like a lot of times that um, there are, are folks out there that try to eliminate that market discipline um, by wrapping things up in some sort of a contractual scheme. If we have any questions out in the audience, I want to make sure we get to those. I'm sure we have some. So, Dr. Rickner. I'd like to give some thought to that. Briefly talk about Medicare and not in good terms, but it's they have begun to see that they are on a pathway of destruction financially. Um, and they have approved a couple of measures, or they have done, but they've approved a couple of measures for the allowance of DPC within Medicare. And I just wondered if, uh, what y'all's thoughts were on payment changes within Medicare moving forward that, you know, even some of us that are opted out uh, may participate in or uh, can be worked into a uh, free market sort of system. They're, they're willing to pay a, a monthly fee for care. And I didn't know if that translated into your world, Keith, or um, if you'd heard some of what I'm talking about. No, I, I hadn't heard that. I've said for a long time Medicare does not need tweaking. Medicare needs a competitor. Um, you know, the United States Postal Service does not need to be tweaked. They need to have competitors that can carry first-class mail, and then they won't exist. Um, and Medicare would not exist 
Um, it's an it's a system that is completely based on theft run by weasels, and um, anything that happens after that original theft downstream of that is is just an increasingly immoral disaster. So uh, Medicare doesn't have any money that they didn't first steal from someone's wages. Um, it's a it's a concept that I mean it's socialized medicine. It's it's a failed concept. It's not subject to the normal feedback uh, that the market would render, the normal discipline the market would render. Uh, people don't have a choice. I mean, if you're on Medicare, what else are you going to do? So what can they get away with? Well, they can get away with whatever they want to. So they, they don't have that accountability Jay just described where you can fire them or you can choose not to patronize them. So anything they wanted to do inside of their cesspool, uh, it, it doesn't matter if they clean it up a little, it's still a cesspool. So I, I'm tell this the most liberating thing I did was walk away from, from, those, from those people. And for all they say about the reforms, there's still so many gross and obvious things that are going on. Uh, Medicare overpays hospitals for the very same service provided in an independent facility. This whole site neutrality thing where the payment is the same uh, for everyone, that is going nowhere, yet that's the source of the revenue that hospitals use to buy physician practices and buy out competitors and on and on and on. So, you know, Medicare feeds the hospital beasts. Um, they, it's a very, very gross system. We, we were Medicare certified until very recently. In the old days, the health department, state health department would raid us because they raid people whenever they want to. And at the end of the at the end of the raid, they would say, "Do you want to be Medicare certified?" Well, that meant you had to answer six or eight other things, or you had to endure five or six more just complete violations of what you knew was correct. And it wasn't too bad until about two years ago when they showed up and they said, do you want to be Medicare certified? And I said, sure. And then they went through and told us that no trash can in the facility could hold more than 11 gallons if we were going to be Medicare certified. That was one of like 10 things. And I think you've never seen a cruciate ligament reconstruction the trash after which would fill a 55 gallon drum one and a half times. Uh, so I decided after that inspection, if they ever asked again, I would say, no, we, we don't want to be Medicare certified. Well, everything changed. Medicare decided to weaponize these private contractors to show up, not with the health department, but on their own for your surprise Medicare inspection raid. The one that showed up at our facility let us know that were we to hire her as a consultant to help us with these issues going forward, that our inspection would probably go a bit easier. And so I said, hold your thought. I'm, I'm going to go figure out a way that I can terminate this. She saw, I said, no, I'm, I'm going to find out how do I terminate our Medicare certification because I don't want what you're selling. And then the real kind of extortion started. Uh, it was a real shakedown and Medicare funds this. There is no reason for any facility that's licensed, should they even be licensed, there's no reason for any facility to be Medicare certifi certified, none. And yet Medicare funds these raids that the big boys can endure, 
that the underdogs struggle with. And so when I hear that Medicare has embraced site neutrality and that they've defunded these shakedown artists that they have in their employ, then I'll believe part of what they say when they say they want to make it better. I don't have that much of an opinion, but uh, as a uh, <laughs> as a patient, if if my DPC ever decided to start taking Medicare dollars and become a Medicare uh, physician, that will be the last time I visit that DPC because they're not a DPC anymore. Uh, I don't want I don't want a doc. If I, if I wanted a doc like that, I'd go back I'd go back to Integris Family Medicine. Um, that's that's just my two cents. I think I don't disagree with anything you said. I've been opted out for many years now. Uh, where do you see it going? I mean, we, we do have Medicare beneficiaries that they don't have a choice, and that's what they have. So, how can we, as a free market people, sort of help help them? Uh, we have DPC patients that are they, they pay for work and we have that relationship. That's my world, but uh, it's different in your world. And I'm just wondering where you might see it going because it, it's a crashing train, and um, somebody's going to be there to pick up some of the pieces. Um, and I, I don't I don't know where it's headed and when it's going to crash, but it's going to. You know, um, Murray Rothbard talked about the importance of allowing the trains to crash that's that's part of the market process that's part of the cleansing you have to flush the toilet once in a while and these failed concepts these um, failed dreams of central planners they need to they need to crash and that's part of the learning process where everyone gets it through their thick head what works and what doesn't. So you've provided an alternative, a very affordable alternative um, that can be bankrolled just by what people save buying their meds on their, you know, on what's not covered many times. So uh, we feel like at Surgery Center of Oklahoma, we're providing an alternative. We have affordable surgery solutions. Um, and many times, and while an individual may not have that amount surrounded by their family members in their community, maybe they do. So, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't see Medicare's crashing and hitting the wall as anything foreboding. I see that as a reason for celebration. That's, uh, that's, that, that needs to happen. It should have happened a long time ago. Uh, without all of all that's been done to prop it up, it would have happened uh, a long time ago. Having another question from anyone right now? Um, obviously, I, we could spend the rest of the afternoon talking about the COVID last few months, but we know that it distorted the market significantly and and the demand the consumers we talk about the consumer what they value so that demand has been stifled i think most people feel like there's going to be a rapid some kind of quick rebound at some point because there's pent up demand but going forward from here will there be changes that entrepreneurs in the free market medicine really need to take into consideration going forward uh, from this point that Yeah, from uh, from a, a, an administrator's third party administrator's perspective, yeah, it, it, there's definitely some things that need to be take note of, take note of. Um, I would say that the independent DPC physicians and the the, the independent um, surgery centers and and the free market medical providers out there, I, I would view it as an opportunity because prices are going up uh, at the hospitals um, dramatically. Um, they are using, you know, obviously, you know, whether they <clears throat> lost revenue or not, I don't know how important that is for a not-for-profit hospital, but that's another subject. Um, but they darn sure want to make up for it. They want to make up for not 
being as nonprofit, you know, as they <laughs> thought they were going to be. And so they're, they're struggling, they're, they're scrambling to, you know, cover that loss. Um, and that won't, that's not going to come back down. I mean, if COVID disappeared tomorrow, um, the, the, the increase in costs at the charge master level are not going to come down. They're going to use it as an opportunity, just like they've always done, um, which provides an opportunity for the surgery centers of Oklahoma of America. And, and as DPC, it, it become as costs continue to go up in the, in, in the, the traditional environment, it becomes the alternative environment. The free market environment becomes more and more appealing to the employers. Um, the Kempton team, we look at our role as a TPA and I look at, at all TPAs. I always in, invite them that this should be their role. And, and that is, um, you know, Dr. Smith mentioned that, uh, you know, the, the, the self-funded employer is, is the sleeping giant. Well, I think the independent TPA could act as the smelling salts, um, <laughs> to show them um, how badly they're getting abused by the system out there and then hopefully become uh, a, a facilitator to help them buy from, from high value competitive uh, medical providers. That is a, a huge role of, of an independent TPA. Unfortunately, a lot of my TPA brethren don't, they don't look at themselves that way they're all trying to figure out how they compete with Blue Cross. Um, I don't view that I'm even in the same industry as Blue Cross. Um, but yeah, COVID, I think, is, is an opportunity for what we're all about. Yeah, I've told, I agree. Uh, I've told people that for the first time, we're seeing patients that want to come see us that have insurance. And of course, we don't have any insurance contracts. But they're, they're coming to see us and paying because they don't want to be in the filthy uh, COVID-infested cesspool of a hospital. They want to be, you know, they want to be in someplace clean. Um, that, is, that is something we have actually heard patients and referral docs express to us. The other thing that, that's interesting is while, while the health department and the governor in Oklahoma did the wrong thing by uh, banning elective surgeries for a period of time. They did the wrong thing for less of a duration than surrounding states. So they made a mistake, but they didn't stay with it. Well, the states that have stayed with this mistake have been the source of many patients that have come to our facility. So we've seen it as as an opportunity the the email that you know i've told somebody earlier you know i have a breast mass and a bad family history can you help me coming from somebody in a state that considers that elective you know those people came they came to oklahoma for their care there were quite a few of them so it it has been I suppose uh, an opportunity for us because we are in a more liberated environment uh, compared to states like Michigan and Virginia and California and some others. Um, but I've also wondered if employers who are self-funded would sharpen their pencils and be smarter, or if people who were not self-funded who ought to be would and take on more risk. and. So I'm I'm optimistic that the number of companies that are self-funded and those that are will be smarter buyers going forward is all downstream of this of this disaster. Yeah, I think I'm sure I know the answer to this question because just how you guys think. But you know the CARES Act and the bailouts we bailed out just about every industry and now of course we're bailing out the airline industry and the first CARES Act gave billions of dollars to big hospitals to, to bail them out. There are people even in sort of in our circles of free market people that would like to see if, if we're going to have another bailout of some kind of the hospitals that 
that is connected to price transparency. I would just love to sort of get your thought on that. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I'll settle down. Okay. All right. Give you a cooling off yeah, period cool before off you answer. Bit. Okay. You know, my comment there, and I'm, I may answer this a little differently than what you expected. Um, I'm going to beat up on the not-for-profit hospital systems. Um, uh, you know, we we all are familiar with the concept of, of a not-for-profit hospital, and we all know that it's kind of a sham, and, and they, they are profitable. They have, uh, you know, hundreds of millions, of, if not uh, billions of dollars. Uh, you could call it an endowment and a reserve and surplus or whatever. It's on hand. Let's just put it that way. And I wonder in a national emergency pandemic where the hospital revenue has gone down because of, of health concerns, because, you know, we can't do elective surgeries because it was not prudent from a, a risk mitigation standpoint, um, especially for the not-for-profit hospitals, the fact that a not-for-profit hospital now needs a bailout They've been being bailed out every day they're open. <laughs> but as a taxpayer, what did we get for that? If they don't have to dip into their surplus to weather a catastrophe, what does the taxpayer get for in exchange for that not-for-profit status? That's what I'd like to see somebody stand up in some authority from a podium and, and you know, there's there's every once in a while there's some debate as to as to the validity of not for profit status. I'd like to see it looked at through that lens. And I prefer to use the phrase bail in because it's our money that's being bailed in. You know, they're really not they're kind of being bailed out, but it's really a bail in. You ought to focus on the victim of the crime. Um I've, I've said forever that Medicare is the only payer that has F-16s and tanks. And that's not a coincidence. Um, it's all about force and coercion. And the idea that you're going to have a bail-in attached to a coercive price transparency mandate is... Yeah, I'm sorry, it contaminates the whole beautiful, noble idea of price transparency when you've got to feed it to someone's stomach through a rubber hose that you force down their esophagus. It just that it, it brings this force and coercion into into the picture that does not belong. I mean, we are peaceful people and we are about mutually beneficial exchange. We're not about forcing anybody to do anything. So I don't know, I just, you feel like when you combine price transparency with mandates with, or, you know, failure to provide a bail-in, it's, it's like you're mixing in the wrong crowd that's gonna ruin your reputation. So that's how, what I think. Excellent. All right, any one last question? We want to end on a positive note. <laughs> Um, you, you had some really good optimism in talking about what could come about from a free market perspective from COVID because prices are going to go up. For, so that's sort of a two-edged sword. Nobody wants to see prices go up, but at the same time, it could drive people to us. So what are some other positive thoughts about this movement? We've talked some about reaching the tipping point, like what is that? Is, is, is that a certain percentage of the, of the market cash payers? You know, when we talk about economics and prices, ultimately the consumer should be the one setting the price, not responding to the, in, in a sense, that the price emerges based on what the consumer is willing to pay. And so the provider should be coming up with their price based on the consumer demand. Right now, we're kind of have the flip side of that, and we have sellers that are setting the price in a in a transparent way for the for the consumer that we're hoping to get the consumers to feel. But I I feel like at some point that has to flip. 
a little bit or at least switch back to where in a free market would be a little bit more driven by the consumer where you're going to have enough cash buying consumers to say, nah, we're not going to pay even what you're paying. Maybe they might say, nah, we got other options. So where, where's the optimism that we can take from that? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we've recognized that from the very beginning, you know, a lot of the things that, that we do as a facilitator, um, and a member of the FMMA, um, I completely realize, and I tell my team that, you know, in a, in a true functioning free market economy, a lot of the things that we're doing shouldn't be necessary. In fact, we could be seen as interfering with the true free market. Um, but until that, and I'll be very happy when that moment comes, um, but right now, the, the, one of the problems is that the buyers out there, whether it be individual consumers or it, it be uh, their employer in conjunction with the, the patient, there is, so, there is such little price awareness that, I mean, people have not bought health care. They have not paid to, you know, to, to set a broken bone. They have not paid for anything for two generations so that they really don't have an ability to discern what is a reasonable price or not. And, and at some point they will as, as more and more entrants come in. But I think right now, whether it be employers or it be DPC docs or, or uh, it, it be third party administrators or whatever, we're, we're kind of acting as crutches. I mean, when Dr. Rickner says, you know, hey, patient, I, I understand that you need to have an MRI. I think you should go to this place because it's a great deal. It's a really good price. They really have to take your word for it because they have no basis for comparison. And I hope that, that within my lifetime that changes. Um, one of the other things, though, that, that I have reason for optimism, um, I, I don't, I don't, James, I don't believe that there is going to be a quote tipping point. I, I thought years past there, there would be some sort of critical mass. And all of a sudden there's this mass adoption. I don't think it's going to be that. I think it's going to be, it's going to be incremental progress. Um, and it's going to be a long game. And as, as, uh, Dr. Dale mentioned, it is, it is, um, it is just slow, steady growth. And I think sometimes it's going to accelerate. I mean, from our perspective at, at, uh, at our, at our TPA, um, I would say a hundred percent of our new business is coming to us because of what we stand for. They're not finding us because they found us on the internet. They found us because we're these radical free market people that tell the truth. Um, and are on their side. To me, that's kind of a tipping point because that that didn't exist years ago. And and now, um, but but are we absolutely covered up um, with employers just banging down our door? No, but it is steady, steady, continual growth. And the fact that they're coming to us for the right reason now, as opposed to us having to you know, force feed it to them that, Hey, this is why you should be with us. Um, that I view that as progress. And because of that progress, I have optimism that we are, that this is sustainable and it is going to ultimately win out. Yeah, I'm, I'm always optimistic. I think the market uh, is powerful and I'm, I'm seeing former hospital enemies, uh, want to work with us at the Surgery Center of Oklahoma. We we receive requests for procedures that can only appropriately be performed on an inpatient basis. And so we're working with hospitals who 20 years ago were bent on our destruction. And I send an email and I get a price from the CFO and we create a bundle and connect a patient to to one of these full service hospitals that wants to do this. And I see that is incredibly uh, significant in reason for optimism. Um, I think some of the hospitals know that a more open and fairly priced environment is coming at them like a train. And I think some may actually adopt it before it's forced on them. Um, 
But I think the main reason, and I sound like a broken record, the main reason I am really optimistic is that the narrative, the narrative has changed. We are not the we are not the weirdos in the tinfoil hat anymore talking about posting prices. There, there are fines and penalties starting January one for those who don't. I mean that's a one eighty, um, and I love it when you and I finally disagree on something. Mm. So it has been a long and incremental road, but I think there is a tipping point. I think that. I don't think we should sell this movement short of anything than it really is. It's a revolution. And the revolutions, they simmer, but then there's a flashpoint. And I really do think there's a flashpoint, and I think it's sooner rather than later. Anybody be a fool to predict when. But when I think people and a few more people realize the extent to which we've all been lied to, that's going to spread. That I, I still am anticipating a real flashpoint, tipping point, but we'll, uh, we'll have to find out something to bet on that's fine. I was going to say, I'll buy dinner. Okay, okay. okay. That. Well, I've, oh, we have one more question? Okay. Question okay. So with the CMS regulation for price transparency, they have is it 70, and then they have a host of other uh, uh, procedures and uh, lactose and things that have to be posted. There's still a very minimum number out of they could go through the CPT codes of you know, tens of thousands and still keep it quite mysterious in what they actually are exposing to the public face. Uh, do you have a thought on that? My thought. Oh, I do. This is like, we're not there yet. They're, they're going to be able to mask the price transparency to such a degree that it's not going to be yet. The price transparency. Do you see that? I, I absolutely see that. Um, the whole the good thing about the executive order for price transparency is that it changed the narrative, it changed the way we we're talking about this whole thing. The hospitals and the industry, um, I predicted and jaded to, they would work very hard to redefine or cloak what their transparency was going to be. So it was very opaque. So there were, I believe, 70 required. And uh, then, yeah, and then they choose the rest. Um, but as Dr. Dale told me earlier, I mean, what what they'll obviously do is just put out some, you know, rack list of their charge master or some pricing that's got codes attached and it's not going to necessarily be meaningful. It's certainly not going to be bundled. So there was, and, and the other thing is the fine, the failure to comply is $300 a day. And so most of the hospitals have been advised to just pay the penalty. I mean, $300 a day to a big hospital system is nothing. That is nothing. I was threatened the other day because I refused to betray a patient's strictest confidence with $10,000 a day fine, and that's at the state level. So $300 a day for a big hospital system is nothing. So I think we'll see many of them ignore it and pay the penalty. And then we'll see others comply in a non-meaningful way. All the while, price transparency will be redefined into what is the patient's out of pocket. That was Jay's prediction. And I think, and that's already going on. Um, and then the next phase when Congress says, no, we mean it, is the hospitals will begin to buy exemptions. So they'll, they'll extend the equivalent of carbon credits to those who say, well, yeah, we're a critical access hospital. That should not be required of us. So I think that'll be, but it's government. I mean, it's the state. It is a failed idea, uh, particularly in an industry as critical as, uh, as healthcare. 
yeah, the rush to redefine transparency is 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 on. It was on before the way before the executive order. Um, I mean, the only definition of transparency that matters is what the buyer thinks it should be. Um, I mean, that, that's it. it. It can't be. It can't be regulated. It can't be mandated. It'll never be transparency. It will never be what we expect it to be unless it's defined by the market. Excellent. Well, this has been a great day. I appreciate you guys answering questions for our members and those that will watch later. Look forward to a full on conference in 2021, unless an asteroid hits on November the 3rd or whatever. So I think we're good. Thanks and have a great day.